Hello, welcome to Engineering with Rosie Live. Just having a few technical problems, which is uh, the norm for me, it seems. So I'm really excited to be back here for my second um, live stream episode. I am keen to first check that everything is working okay. And secondly, let me know where you're calling in from. I, um, I'm still trying to work out exactly um, which times I'm going to do these to uh, catch everyone that wants to watch them. So yeah, let me let me know in the comments where you're watching from today. So um, yeah, also just about the comments, I am going to answer as many questions as I can live, but um, it is actually hard to see and deal with all the questions and comments later. So if you have something that I don't get to, then please write it on the video page, not in the live comment stream. And on that note, thanks so much to everybody who um, came last time and watched and made comments. I really love the constructive feedback. I have taken on board some of the comments. I've got a, a moderator here um, today to help with the comments, my sister. All right, so um, this live stream is sponsored by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. And I wanna thank them for making it possible. And also big thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon community for sending me their questions ahead of of this live stream. So today I'm going to be talking about in, um, gravity energy storage and um, I know that hydro or pumped hydro is technically a gravity energy storage but I'm going to be focusing on the non-hydro technologies. Um, the reason why I wanted to do this topic today was because uh, excuse me, because Energy Vault have recently announced that they are going public. So yeah, Energy Vault have announced that they're going to list on the New York Stock Exchange um, through a merger, through a, a SPAC. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the finance of it because I'm not a, not a financial uh, analyst, but I did think that a lot of people are going to be interested in the company and how the technology works um, and also what the competitive landscape in this area looks like. So, I mean, what other um, companies using similar technologies are doing. So I thought that this would be nice and topical for today. Um, as always, everything I talk about is just my own opinion. I'm not trying to provide any investment advice or financial advice or any kind of formal advice um, of any kind. I did get in touch with all the companies that I'm going to talk about in detail today. Um, some were more forthcoming than others with additional information. but. Any of the companies I talk about today, if you think that I made a mistake, then feel free to get in touch and I'll address your concern in the next live stream. And on that note, I do have some extra information from Vortex Bladeless, who I talked about last time. They gave some more information about some of the more common viewer questions and um, I'll go through some of that at the end. Okay, so what have we got in the comments? Where is everybody calling in from? We've got the UK, Paris, Romania, oh cool. Ireland, New Zealand, Netherlands, Korea. Hi, Korea. Hi, <laughs> Hi India. And um, I did see somebody had woken up at, um, yeah, we've got Jim, Jim Worthy, who has called in at 4 a.m. USA Eastern time. So, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that sacrifice getting up so early, Jim. And I will be talking um, about the, the trains, Aries, the um, rail storage. Cool. I just wanted to talk a bit about why gravity storage at all. I have this slide, which is, um, I actually took it from a presentation that I used for the video I made on Steesdale, um, grid scale, grid scale storage, the thermal energy storage. Um, and it lists the storage capacity and the, um, the release time, like the storage duration on this. And so you can see this is batteries here around about somewhere, you know, one megawatt hour plus or minus and releasing over a period between, um, you know, minutes up to maybe a day sometime in the future. And I think that um, gravity storage fits in probably in the top, top half of the same area as batteries did. So, I mean, why do we even need any new kind of storage? Everyone talks about lithium ion batteries at the moment and they're awesome, but they're not that cheap, which makes them less suitable for long-term storage. So that's why you see um, like pumped hydro, um, pumped hydro makes up like more than 90% of energy storage that we have at the moment. It's just really easy to add a lot more water without adding a lot more um, cost. So we've got 
a lot of um, capacity, energy storage capacity with the pumped hydro, but it's not so easy to add add more to that. So that's why everyone is so crazy to find what's the next, what's going to be the next big thing in energy storage. And I mean, I personally don't think that it's like a battle between lithium iron and gravity storage or, you know, any of the other kind of storages that are on that chart there, because we have a huge need for more storage as we get more variable renewables, more wind and solar. So the faster and cheaper that we can get new energy storage to come online, then that's, you know, that's the better. Um, okay. Oh, I did also just want to mention that probably um, a more fair competitor for gravity storage would be the off-river pumped hydro. And um, I'm not going to talk about that too much today, uh, but it is something that I have in mind for a future video. So let me know if you would be interested to see a whole video on um, pump storage, but without making a dam. So how does uh, energy storage work? Basically, <laughs> it got very simple, um, very simple physics here. Uh, the amount of energy stored, it's just the, the mass times the height times acceleration due to gravity. So there's the equation there, the energy equals mass times gravity times height. And then they've got this really great example of a cuckoo clock um, showing that gravity energy storage is nothing new. Um, in cuckoo clocks and the old fashioned grandfather clocks, uh, you used to, you know, wind them up um, and you would raise a, a mass up a height and then it would gradually release to power the clock. And since a clock really doesn't use a lot of uh, energy, that was, you know, enough to just raise a small mass up, um, up a pretty small height. Now, obviously, the amount of energy that we want to store to support um, variable renewables is a lot bigger. So we're starting to see really huge it's basically exactly the same thing, but just upscaled a lot. But what I love about the simplicity of this um, formula, MGH, is that it, um, you know, you can't, you can't really cheat with this system. So I don't know, sometimes I'm reading um, press releases about new battery chemistries and they'll say, you know, oh, this has twice the energy density that a lithium ion battery does. And um, you're like, well, I have no way to, to judge that because I have no um, you know, knowledge of the chemistry that you're using. But in the case of a gravity energy storage, then um, there's just, there's no way to double the, you can't do more with half the mass unless you, you know, double the, the height that you're raising it. So I think in that sense, it's really um, easy to, to understand uh, exactly what's going on. Um, so that doesn't mean it's easy though, obviously we don't have any of these gravity energy storage, um, systems commercialized yet. And I guess, I mean, I'll go through in depth, the, um, there's gonna be three main technologies I'm going to go through, but basically I think it's going to be about how cheap we can make it, um, both the capital cost, the upfront cost and the operating and maintenance costs and then how long it will last. Another issue is whether you need any um, special geography to install it, all those kinds of things. Okay, so um, I just wanted to do a, a brief history of gravity energy storage. So as well as the clock example, there's another neat little um, technology, which was a gravity light which was made for developing countries that didn't have access to electricity to allow them to, um, you know, study at night without burning kerosene inside their houses. Um, so this was basically just a, a bag that you fill full of rocks or whatever you've got around outside. You can um, raise it up and then it will gradually lower and give you light for up to 20 minutes. Um, it was interesting when I was looking at the history of this that actually when they first came up with the idea, it wasn't very useful because that was before um, LED lights had gotten really efficient. So it just didn't make enough power. So then the technology, the LED light technology improved and they had this um, product for a few years. But then very quickly after that, the cost of batteries, the cost of solar panels dropped so much that it kind of became obsolete because you can just as cheaply get um, solar panels and a battery and, and people are, you know, by now charging mobile phones and stuff as well as wanting light. So that's kind of a interesting little example on the small scale. Then on the large scale, there was this company Energy Cache, and they had 
this system it used um it used ski lifts with buckets and then they filled up um the buckets with gravel so they would yeah basically haul gravel uphill when they wanted to store electricity and then um, let the gravel buckets um you know drag the the generator and um, generate electricity when when they wanted electricity um and what's interesting about that technology is that the founder of that um his name was aaron fike i think that's how you say it he was the founder and ceo of that company and um that that company isn't um operating any longer but he then went on to um to start energy vault later on he was a co-founder of energy vault um and yeah so the the co-founder and ceo of of both of those companies energy cash and energy vault he had an interesting design philosophy um and i found a quote from him that says he was consciously looking to develop a business that involved as little technology risk as possible when he founded the company, um, he says, I felt that the biggest problem facing clean technology companies was the marketing and financing problem, not the technology problem. So I set out to come up with a solution which used components from proven industries that we could point to, reducing uncertainty about lifetime performance and cost. And so I thought that was a really good summary of kind of the design philosophy for all of these um, gravity storage companies and, and also a lot of other new energy storage techs like thermal storage and compressed air. They're taking really simple physical principles and um, combining components from mature established industries to get a solution to a new problem that we have. Um, so yeah, there's not really any new technologies. We could have made a, a concrete battery 50 years ago if we had wanted to, but the problem that we're solving is new. The um, you know product is really only needed now as we get large amounts of variable renewables in our electricity grids. So uh, this is really interesting to me because the engineering work that I do, I'm all well, 90% of the time I'm just combining mature components from different industries, but using them somewhere new, you know, like putting a big uh, fan into a wind turbine blade or any, anything else like that, you know, something that we've been using for decades, um, working very uh, reliably in some other industry and I'll try and put it somewhere else. And, you know, I've got a whole career worth of <laughs> challenges in uh, finding new ways that mature technologies don't work flawlessly the first time that you try them in a new application. And so, yeah, I think that that is basically the story of, of all these companies. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I might just take a look at some comments now. So I'll see if we've got any lined up. Um, so gravity storage using space elevator, space tether from Charlie Zuo. That is, that is really... Uh, interesting kind of futuristic thing i know that um there are some like space solar power um technologies uh focusing <laughs> focusing on on earth i haven't seen anybody using the gravity storage with a space elevator but um yeah let me let me look into that and get back to that another time um another question So from Cather's E point, <laughs> thank you. Storage is so important. Nice graph. That graph comes from, um, yeah, Steesdale, <laughs> grid scale electric. And uh, I think it's really interesting to see all those technologies and how they, how they interact together. Um, okay. All right. So now I'll move on to energy vault and yeah, they have um, actually one thing in common between all of the technologies I'm going to talk about is they've all been through some really big pivot. They've all changed their design philosophy in some way. And um, yeah, I mean, I, as a development engineer, I find that really interesting. So I just want to share, first of all, this um, this video of the this is how I first saw like, the first technology from Energy Vault that I saw. And it's probably what most people who know the 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 company that what they associate with energy vault so you've basically got a tower um i think they were expecting it to be like 80 or 100 meters tall 
um, and then six cranes on there. They've got these blocks, concrete blocks in the first version of their technology. They weighed, I think they weighed 35 tonnes each and they uh, lift them up when they want to store energy and they let them lower when they want to generate um, electricity. And <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, I actually, I really wanted to make a video about this and I did see this technology um, one time when I was, I was actually visiting, I was nearby in the area. So I saw their second prototype um, in Lugano in Switzerland. Um, you can see it behind me. So this was in October um, and they were already dismantling it and um, they had just been through some tests before that um, or, yeah, to um, their commercial demonstration unit, they called it. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so like I said, I actually, I really wanted to do a video on this technology um, and I got in touch with them and their team was initially interested to help me, but um, then they didn't, when I sent them the list of questions, they didn't, they didn't want to answer my, oops, they didn't want to answer my list of technical questions. So, um, in the end, I didn't, I didn't go ahead with that video because I had some really big questions and I think that most people who have seen this have really similar questions. Um, uh, it's pretty easy to, to find a few design flaws and I just wanted to show, um, at least on this, I don't know, a lot of you guys probably watch this channel, um, Thunderfoot, and so if you want to see a good, like, thorough documentation of all the really obvious um, issues with this, then I'd recommend, um, yeah, this video. Um, but there are also a couple of criticisms uh, that I don't think are quite right, because he does talk about how, you know, there's this issue with if you, um, you know, once you start dismantling the tower, then you're going to not have very much um, height anymore, height difference to get a lot of energy out of it. But you can see their tower is like 50 blocks high, so it's not going to have nearly the same effect as, as what, um, what he was getting at there. Um, but then there are plenty of other criticisms that I think um, he is spot on with and the most obvious for me was that, you know, this is a tower operating out in the wind. If you have a look at um, commercial cranes, they don't usually operate when it's super windy. Um, a lot of the documentation for Energy Vault had these towers in amongst wind turbines, so obviously in like purposely windy locations. Um, and they never really gave an answer for how they would be precisely raising and lowering these blocks, stacking them up into a tower that's supposed to just stand there all structurally sound. You know, it's like 80 or 100 metres tall of blocks just stacked on top of each other with no, <laughs> like nothing giving it structure except for the stacked blocks. Um, so that was, um, yeah, like a really big uh red flag for me and then um if you yeah so then this is the same um the same thing that you just saw me standing in front of a little while ago but this was just a couple of months earlier when they commissioned it and it was apparently grid connected and it did all sorts of tests and they show some in this video but the one thing that they never show is <laughs> what is their solution for when it's windy they don't show it operating in windy conditions and there's only this couple of um snippets in a couple of seconds it's going to show raising and lowering some blocks but you can see from the surrounding trees and um and there's a crane in the background yeah i mean you can see how still the, the trees and everything are here that this is a really I mean, this crane isn't moving at all it's a really windless day so um, I just thought I had heard so many people raise this issue of the wind and the only thing that the, the company says on their website. So they talk about their innovations that um, allow them to, you know, make this tower and they say that they have the advanced trajectory computation and applied computer vision. So I guess that that is all to overcome this idea of the wind. But like I said, uh, to me, if you have a a prototype and um, you don't show it addressing the major technical risk, then that's 
I don't know. It doesn't mean that they necessarily failed those tests, but I think that that's the impression that it, that it gives. And then one interesting thing is now when you look at their um, their new website, you can see that they have changed their concept, and now they don't have the the big Jenga tower anymore. Now they seem to have been now they seem to be enclosing it in a building, and I um, mean. You can't see exactly, but it looks like everything is on rails and yeah, going to to stack um, in, within these rails. So it seems like they never managed to solve. Well, I would guess that they didn't manage to solve the issues with the wind, and so also though a lot of their innovation is probably not needed anymore now that they um, are doing all this within the within a building. Um, Oh, I did get in touch with them uh, again to ask for input for the live stream. And again, they were very keen to help. But then when I sent them a list of technical questions, they didn't want to help me anymore and suggested that I um, that I don't cover the new technology. They said, um, what did they say? They are planning to release more information that covers several of my questions, but they have to be careful about when and how they do it because they're a publicly traded company now. With that in mind, my suggestion would be to hold off on profiling their EVX until they've shared that information. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, they have it on their website. It's in their investor pack. They're about to list publicly. I, I think that that's a really strange response and I find it surprising that, um, uh, I mean, I don't know what kind of investors they're going after. They're, they're listing publicly, but I guess they're not trying to convince the average person off the street to buy shares because we just don't have information for any of the major technical risks yet. Um, so a couple of things about the new iteration of their design. So, I mean, it's good that they seem to have gotten rid of the, like, the most obvious um, technology risk with um, yeah, the issue with the wind and the very high stacked tower that doesn't have any um, other support. Um, and I just wanted to show they do somewhere in here, um, show the size of it. So this is, um, they call this an idea, um, somewhere else they call it an idea anyway. Here it makes it look like it's an actual project, but I'm not sure that it's it's necessarily going ahead yet. So the idea is that they replace a coal-powered fire station with um, a solar farm and an energy vault resiliency center. So this will have heaps of concrete blocks and cranes inside it, is my my guess. And then they give a dimension here for the heights, um, 100 meters. So then you know if you kind of like uh, just like measure with your <laughs> your fingers on the on the image, you can see it, it's going to be like three, four hundred meters square, the area, um, and that's a 500 megawatt hour um, system. So it's it's large. These aren't going to be, you know, in um, in your neighborhood. Well, I, I hope not. I think that they'll be, yeah, big and um, probably noisy. So it's definitely like an industrial kind of um, kind of facility. Um, okay, I just want to talk through a few more things in this. Um, you can get this document, by the way, from their website. It's um, their investor investor pack, I think it's called. Um, and I, there's a few interesting assumptions in here. So they have estimated their their levelized cost of energy. I think it is yeah um, dollars per megawatt hour. Um, and ranked against their competitors. And I don't want to get too much into the finance here because uh, it's really, one, it's really hard to to make an accurate assessment of a technology that's never been built yet. Um, and two, because like I'm not a financial <laughs> analyst, but it is interesting that their technology is here on um, one end and then their most similar competitor is Gravitricity. Um, in between is a whole bunch of different battery chemistries basically. Um, so the most similar technology to them is the one that's furthest away from them. And um, I just thought that was that was pretty strange because um, we'll go through Gravitricity later and you'll see that um, it's, it's hard to imagine how you come up with this totally different cost potential for two technologies that really are quite similar. Is it? Oh yeah, they talk about their patents and their key intellectual property. Um, and I think we mentioned that most of their 
key innovations really did seem to be related to that problem that they had kind of made for themselves with storing out in the open with the wind. And I do think it's kind of something inherent in the gravity energy storage. You know, we, we heard before that the whole philosophy is to try to pick um, technologies that are basically assembling mature components, um, subsystems from other industries, assembling them together to solve a new problem so that they won't have all the technology risk. But you kind of can't have it both ways. It's not like it's either it's mature or it's a brand new exciting technology. And I think that um, it's uh, interesting to try and have it both ways. Um, oh yeah, and then there was one more interesting um, aspect. I actually didn't note down the page. But they're making their blocks now. They're not making them out of concrete anymore. They're making them out of um, where is it? They're making them out of a, a mix of recycled wind turbine blades and ash and um, yeah, here it is. Um, recycled wind turbine blades and ash, and I think also um, just dirt from the local area or from construction. And so I thought that that's good. Um, it's <clears throat> uh, it's definitely better not to be using all that concrete, all that cement, um, you know, there's a huge emissions uh, footprint associated with that. And so I hope that their buildings are also going to be made using recycled materials and not lots of um, concrete and steel for, for those as well. Okay, so that's what I had to say about Energy Vault. And let's see if there are some comments about that one. So from Matter45, do you think because of the amount of moving parts in a gravity system that they can compete with systems that have no moving parts? And I think that that is definitely going to be one of the interesting things to, to watch in the next few years as all of these gravity systems have that in common. Obviously, you can't get any energy out of it until you move it from a high, a high level to a low level. And I do think that a lot of these companies um, are selling that there'll be low maintenance or no maintenance, but every time that you have moving parts, you obviously have wear. Um, and so I think that we're, we're really going to have to keep a close eye on what the operating and maintenance costs for these systems actually are. So I think that's a really good point. Um, another question from um, Michael O'Flaherty, sorry if I said that wrong. Uh, the bit that I don't get about concrete storage is the energy density. Raise a 25 tonne weight through 100 metres, MGH equals 25,000 times 9.81, very precise, times 100 <laughs> equals uh, 24 and a half million joules or 6.8 kilowatt hours, which is about a dollar 40 of electricity, not much really. Um, yeah. It, I mean, that's that's the beauty of the, the simplicity of MGH, right? It's very easy to calculate and and um, and see on a simple level how much that's going to be. So I think one of the aspects of these systems and what, when I talk to some of the other companies, I mentioned these are long lifetime um, systems. If you know, if you've only got a five year period, you are never going to pay it back to get um, a cheap, <laughs> cheap cost of energy. And actually I did put, um, a, I think I put a link in the description. There's a levelized cost of storage calculator and you can go on there and play around with, yeah, like what your capital cost is going to need to be, what the lifetime is going to need to be for some of these things to to get a you know a reasonable um, cost of energy out of it so uh, I think that's a that's a good point and definitely it relies on a really long lifetime for these um, any more questions okay from British biker 97 who I just need a comment that British biker 97 was actually one of the first people to comment <laughs> comment on my YouTube channel back uh, over a year ago now um, so that's cool to see, to see still around. Is there potential for this to be distributed? Have they said how many blocks will be paired with each generator? Um, I don't think Energy Vault looks like they want to make it very distributed. They do seem to be mostly talking about really big systems now. And I think, um, oh, I don't think I have it here, but there was a there was a paper that I read that showed the, and I think actually I did link in the description. There's a paper that shows the the future um, 
projection for levelized cost of storage and shows how um, how it changes when you um, double the capacity, um, so double the you know the amount of energy stored versus doubling the amount of power. And they did mention that um, that these systems scale quite well. So that's one of the advantages of them compared to lithium ion batteries. Um, yeah, but one of the other companies, which I'll get to in a minute, they did um, mention a lot about distributed energy. So yeah, I'll talk about that more soon. Um, any more questions? Oh, that might be a no. Okay, so I will move on to the next one then, which is um, gravitricity. So gravitricity is pretty similar to energy vault in that they are hauling very heavy blocks up and down, but instead of doing it in a, with a tower, they're doing it in a hole. So their initial idea is that it will be um, in disused mine shafts. Yeah, so they take a, a big hole, probably it's from a disused mine shaft, but it can also be from, um, it can also be purpose, purpose built. They do have some pictures on their website which show um, big shafts drilled underneath uh, skyscrapers to provide energy storage for the building. So, I mean, that's pretty out there. I'm not sure I think that will happen, but that's kind of, you know, in their range of ideas for how they might use it. Um, yeah, and the same principle. You take something very heavy, you haul it up when you have excess <laughs> electricity you want to use, and then you drop it down when you, um, when you want to generate. Um, so I did talk to a couple of people from this company um, and asked them a few questions. So I asked them, first of all, obviously, well, the most obvious question probably is why holes and not a, a tower? I mean, it seems to me at first glance, it seems easier to build a tower than to dig a, a huge hole. But um, they mentioned that, you know, we've got this equation MGH and they're really pushing after the, the H part of that. So existing mine shafts um, are commonly hundreds of meters deep, so they can get a lot, a lot more um, height difference from a hole than they could from, you, can, you know, you can't make a energy vault system that was 300 meters tall, but you can get a, a mine shaft that is. Um, they also talk about the lower visual impact. So it just looks like a shed on top and they did give me a handy little, um, computer <laughs> rendered image to show uh, their big system. I think it's supposed to be 20, maybe it's five, or I can't remember exactly, five, 20 megawatts anyway, lots of megawatts. Um, and then there's a, a family frolicking in the field next door to it. <laughs> um, also, they say if you've got a, a mine shaft, usually they're lined, and so that means you don't have to build as big a um, foundation because a lot of the structure is taken care of by the mine shaft lining. Um, yeah, so that, that was their main reasoning. Um, I had thought mine shaft doesn't really seem like there's going to be mine shafts near places where you need electricity, but according to them, there are a lot in, um, Eastern Europe, for example, um, they say that you really need a recently used mine and, um, yeah, because otherwise you're going to have to do a lot of work to, to get it back up to spec. Um, and you need one that uh, apparently the mines in Germany aren't suitable because they're filling up with water and um, subsiding and stuff. So, but they said there's a lot of good ones in Eastern Europe and a few other places around the world. And then the other customer that they are in talks with or the other type of customer is miners. Um, so they want to, you know, green the, the energy supply for the mining operations. So a lot of mine are building solar farms and wind turbines, and then they would put something like this in as well. But they did specify that you wouldn't install a system if you've got, you know, like five years left of operations in your mine, you need 25 years remaining lifetime to get this um, to be cheap. Just like we were talking about before, you know, it's um, you need a lot of cycles to, <laughs> to, to pay it off to make up for that, whatever it was like a dollar, dollar fifty that you that you get every time you raise and lower it, you know, you need a lot of, a lot of dollar fifties to pay for one of these things. Um, okay, so other differences are they've got a much bigger block. This one's 550 tons. So I think it's like 10, 15 times bigger than the energy vault blocks there. 
three meters high, seven and a half meter diameter, and they are um, not made of concrete. They are like a steel basket that's filled with mostly iron ore because it's about twice as dense as concrete. Um, so yeah, if it's twice as dense, that means, you know, obviously the block can be half as big, um, but actually I personally wouldn't be surprised to see them move to a less dense, but cheaper material in the future. Um, yeah, just to, you know, try and get the, the upfront cost lower. Um, one other interesting thing about, um, Gravitricity is that they filed their first patents in 2011 but didn't really get started with development until 2016. And I think that that's kind of indicative of this type of technology that, you know, it's not, it's not new, but it's just a new problem. So there was no real point in them <laughs> solving this problem before we had a lot of variable renewables. And I think that financing is pretty, pretty tricky for new energy techs. Um, so I, I think that that's probably the reason why they waited till 2016 to get going. Um, okay, so they have a prototype that they have just finished testing. Um, it's, it's real. There's some pictures. Actually, I think I have a video of it. I can show you as well, but, um, it's easier to see in the computer model. This is a 250 kilowatt above ground prototype in Leith in Scotland. Um, so they made this prototype to test a few of their key risks. Um, they wanted to one measure the efficiency, which was measured at 80%. Um, and that test was apparently overseen by Scottish power. They also, they're concerned about the, um, the cost of maintaining the cables. Um, apparently where the cables wear out, where they're kind of, you know, like they, they go through a couple of pinch points and, that's where they will wear first. So they tested um, an idea they had to increase the lifetime by moving the cable along a little bit before it wore out. And they say that um, they gained some information from that. And now they expect their cables will last about seven years. They also tested the power quality and the startup speed. It was important to their business case that they could start up in less than one second, um, which is the kind of response time that you need if you're going to be able to use it for an ancillary good services as well as for, you know, actual energy storage or um, arbitrage. So, yeah, this BBC article is the only, only video I could find of their, of their prototype. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> you can go back and see that the, the block lowers. I mean, well, it's not much, so much more to see from that. But I mean, to me, it makes a huge difference. You know, that versus the um, that. You know, uh, you can see that they're actually doing something. So to me, watching that block lower was lower itself was pretty exciting. Um, okay, yeah. So this one's two hundred fifty kilowatts, but this scale of system would never make money. Um, they expect that their first recurring product will be about four megawatts um, and up to 20 megawatts and probably about two to four hours storage duration is their expectation. But I mean, all of these technologies, you can uh, increase the storage duration by just having a lot of blocks as long as you've got somewhere to stack them. Um, and I, they did mention as well that that is something that they are, they have in mind for their system as well. It's not just, they don't, won't always just do one block raising and lowering, which has a lot of nice simplicity about it, but they are also trialing, um, a system for being able to, you know, um, keep, keep extra blocks at the top so that you can increase the storage duration. Okay. So that's what I have to say about Gravitricity. Are there any questions on, um, on that one? Okay, so malachite of Methuselah. How do these gravity systems compare to Hydrostore, the underwater balloon system? Oh, I did. I only briefly looked at, at Hydrostore. That's the um, buoyancy storage, I think, which I thought was cool because um, I always like it when, <laughs> when you see a new energy technology and you can kind of relate it to something that you've ex experienced, um, the, you know, force of nature. So, you know, if you've been blown over by a gust of wind, then you can imagine that there's a lot of power in the wind or got a bad sunburn. <laughs> or for me, when I was surfing, I got dumped by a lot of waves and thought, wow, there's a lot of energy in the waves, which should make wave power. And then for buoyancy storage, did you ever, when you're a kid at your swimming lessons, you know, you've got a, those um, floating kickboards and you could put them under the water. And if you let it up and hit you on the chin, then that would uh, 
that would really hurt. And so when I saw this buoyancy um, store energy storage, I wondered if that's how their founder got the idea of after being hit in the, the chin with a kickboard. So I, um, I haven't looked in depth into that technology, but I do think it's interesting. And I especially think it's interesting because maybe it could combine well with offshore, offshore wind. I guess that's the obvious um, synergy, even though it kind of goes against my normal rule of thumb, which is to never put anything offshore unless it really needs to, really needs to be there. So um, yeah, I'll, I'm sure I'll be talking about that, um, that system more in the future, but sorry, I don't have too much more to <laughs> say about it now. Um, another question? So Simon Lee, are they trying to implement the technology with combined with heat storage system? They are actually, I don't know, maybe you already read on their website, but they had, maybe I can find it. They have um, an announcement that, where is it in the news maybe? Not just heat, not just heat, but also hydrogen. So I guess they've got the idea that they're, um, Actually, I think I have an image of that as well. Yeah, so here we go. Here's their, their graphic one shaft, three uses. So they've um, <laughs> they've got a they've got a big hole. Um, what else can they do with it other than um, gravity storage? So one thing is that they they have I saw they have a patent now or at least an application um, for storing hydrogen um, pressurized inside this. So they've got a dome dome cap to store the hydrogen and because it's underground you know the um the hole is quite quite strong so you can store it at a fairly high pressure and then also um heat exchange to so thermal storage and i did ask for some more details about that but they said basically it's at the idea stage i think someone had an idea and filed a patent and a press release and that's about the extent of it um i did say well i assume that you're not going to be storing hydrogen and heat and the gravity storage all at the same time because you know I would worry about, <laughs> about having moving metal parts in a, a volume of hydrogen seems like a good way to um, get a large explosion. Um, they said they actually do think that they will combine them all together but like I said it's an idea so um, <laughs> yeah I, I think it's I think it's un unlikely but um, let's let's wait and see. <laughs> Okay, another question. How much can it adjust input and output power? So I, um, you can change the speed to change how, yeah, what the what the power is, and I'm not sure how flexible it is. Um, some of the other systems, um, like Energy Vault, and the next one we'll talk about, um, the rail energy storage, they can change the number of blocks that are being raised or lowered at the same time um, to change that, um, to change the power. And I, I don't think that you can do that so much with this one. Um, so you would have to do it by varying the speed. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how exactly how flexible it is like that. But they do want to use it for, you know, supporting um, the grid um, with the fast response time, so frequency support and that sort of thing. So I, uh, I guess it needs to be somewhat flexible at least. Um, another question. So from Conservator, these systems seem to be for short-term storage. Would it be hard to compete with lithium ion in this area? Yeah, that's something that I thought too, because they all call themselves long-term storage. Um, and I think maybe, I mean, it's not, I'm not 100% in this field, so maybe I don't know the precise lingo, but to me, when I hear long-term storage, I think multiple days at least. And these ones usually do seem to be in the order of, you know, one to 10 hours um, and actually, in the energy vault system they do oh, this is really long I'll see if I can find it but they do give an idea yeah here it is um, of the duration and I mean they've got theirs going anywhere from I think it's a lot of logarithmic scale so it's hard to sort of see but you know from an hour up to 20 hours or, or something so maybe one hour to one day um, but mostly we're seeing around 10 hour storage which lithium ion can do that um so in a sense i was surprised i was definitely surprised to see that they're competing with lithium ion
But on the other hand, all the companies and also the independent analysis that I read did seem to think that, you know, over a long project lifetime that these will have a cheaper cost of storage than lithium ion batteries. So um, it, in that sense, it doesn't matter so much that they're competing. And I mean, um, I think that we definitely are not going to have enough lithium ion batteries to do everything that we need to do storage wise. So um, I, if, if we didn't have another technology option like this, then I would think if we were using lithium ion batteries for all the new electric cars that are coming as well as grid scale storage and, you know, whatever else, I think that we would see them go up in price because there would be severe shortages. So I, I was initially thinking of oh, this must be more expensive than lithium ion batteries and the price of them is going down, but I did get convinced from reading some independent analysis that the cost potential is there for these technologies to, you know, for the situations where it makes, where, where it's possible to use them for them to beat lithium ion. Obviously, you're not going to have a um, gravity energy storage system driving your electric car anytime soon. So um, there's still going to be a place for a big place for lithium ion, I think. Um, okay. Um, is there another question or I might move on? One more. Okay, Jim Worthy. On the surface, it seems like you need to make a whole unit of power, so many kilowatts. How does that fit in? You can't ride a brake and waste the energy. Yeah, um, so, I mean, now we're getting into kind of uh, have to know a lot about how the, the grid works. And uh, I think that everybody is bidding in, you know, finite increments anyway. So I'm not sure that that is... Um, on the grid scale, I don't think that's going to be a big problem. If you're trying to use, you know, one energy storage battery for one house, then yeah, that would be a downside. But I think that on the, the utility grid scale that it might not be such a big deal. Okay, so now I am going to move on to ARES, um, A-R-E-S, which is Advanced Rail Energy Storage. Um, I'll go to their website. So this one is rail cars that drag heavy weights up a hill um, when you want to charge and then they um, discharge by yeah, letting the blocks drag the cart down the hill basically. So very similar concept but now instead of a tower, instead of a hole, now we've got a, a hill, a slope um, to provide that height difference. Um, Okay, so they had a prototype or a demonstrator way back in 2013. I think they've been going since 2010, actually. I think this might be the, the first of all of the companies that I, I looked into. Um, yeah, so I just found a snippet of, of this. So this is their old cart. It um, had the motor and the generator on, on board on the cart. They just drive up a hill. Um, comparing it to <laughs> hydro here. Yeah, and so the cart just drives up and down and it's just, you know, like a near electric car where the motor can be a, um, yeah, a motor or a, a generator. Um, so yeah, that was back in 2013. And then um, a couple of years ago, they did a big pivot um, and they changed now to... Um, now they've got the picture. Yeah, now they've got a series of rails, and the motor generator is at the top of the hill, um, not on the cart. And the reason that they did that was basically because it was too too expensive to have all those generators um, on yeah, one per cart. Um, and they also another change that they made was they made the uh, slope steeper. Is it? they say more than 20 degrees slope, whereas in the previous one, they were only about seven degrees. Um, so their point of difference with the other systems is that they use a, a chain um, instead of a cable. And this is a big point for them because they say that the chain is, um, it's, uh, it's a lot lower maintenance. It's more reliable. You can um, have a, a higher loading of it. And they mentioned that, you know, if you've got a chain that breaks, you can replace the broken link. 
you don't have to replace the whole cable. Um, and also for transport costs, they said that it's really challenging to transport. You know, imagine the um, size of the cable that you're going to need for the gravitricity system. You've got a 300 meter long tunnel, then you need a, a 300 meter long cable and big if it's going <laughs> to going to haul a 550 tonne block so um, the mass of that cable is actually hard to, to ship and so they said that the, the um, chain is a lot easier, cheaper for transportation. Um, yeah, so I talked to their chief development officer, Russ Weed, um, and he said one thing which I found quite quotable, which is that he thinks that energy storage is going the way of computers and the internet, so to local storage. You know, we don't um, <laughs> we don't all store uh, all our. Actually, I guess maybe that's a bad analogy because we do have big data centers and um, cloud storage. But anyway, we have storage on our our computers, and he thinks that energy storage is going to go the same way, um, where it's distributed. Um, <clears throat> so they are in the middle of building um, a demonstrator. It's a, in Nevada, 50 megawatt project, which is 10 different rails of five megawatts each. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And actually, I'm, the, I'm not 100% sure of the reason why they, it's very common in this space that you see you go from a tiny, tiny demonstrator of just, you know, proof of concept, which, which is great. That's how I would do it too. And then they go huge all of a sudden. And I guess it's related to the, the financing that, you know, if their customer is going to be utilities, they are not really that interested in, you know, like um, 500 kilowatts or something. They want to see megawatt scale. But if it was me, I would not build 10, a 10 rail system, I'd build one and see what I learned from that and then build the next one um, with that learning in mind. But um, yeah, like I said, I'm not really, uh, I'm sure there's financial reasons for it. And I do know that they um, they were originally hoping that this project would be finished by 2019, but it um, still isn't. And I think that the reason for that is that they're still waiting to finalise their financing. Um, yeah, so... That's their concept. Um, I asked Russ some questions. Um, why why don't they go straight straight up and down like energy vault or gravitricity? Because you know now they need a hill, um, and he said that they don't need to pay for their elevation gain. Um, of course, they do need to find a twenty degree hill, which is pretty pretty steep. Um, and he he did mention that you also do have to do some some earthworks um, to get a, a constant gradient. Um, yeah, and then he also said that the, this allows them to do the chain, do chain the rail and train drive, which he thinks um, is technically superior to the crane and cables. Um, yeah, so better mass bearing capability, no elongation, um, and like I said before, that you can replace a single link rather than a whole cable. Um, then I asked, since they need a hill anyway, why wouldn't you put pumped hydro in these um, in these places? And I, I was thinking off river, um, so you know where you have just like a self-contained reservoir, a water tank at the the bottom and the top, and you pump between them. So then you know you don't need to dam anything. Um, and his answer for why you would do this instead of pumped hydro was that it can be done smaller. Um, Front capex, uh, um, capital expenditure, uh, you know, cost of the equipment is smaller for this. Um, and he mentioned some really big hydro projects and how much they they cost. Um, and also that this is non permanent, so it doesn't need permitting. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think that those are more related to traditional pumped hydro with you know um, open open dams. Um, he also mentioned that they don't need water, but a uh, yeah, off river pumped hydro also doesn't need any water once it's uh, once it's installed. Um, yes, so that that's what I have to say about Aries. <laughs> Had there been any questions about um, that technology in particular? Okay, so from conservator again, how much weight height would you need to store a megawatt hour? Um, so this one, it is, it's 15 minutes 
duration for five megawatts. So um, that's uh, one quarter of five, so <laughs> 1.25 megawatt hours. Um, and I think that he, you can see uh, it's um, it's an American company, so they've <laughs> They've got feet everywhere. I, I don't understand. When actually, it was really funny when I was talking to Russ. He was um, combining the <laughs> uh, – he was talking about megawatt hours but then in um, feet and, you know, uh, we – in the metric system, you can say the equation is MGH but in the – what do they call – I think they call it English units in America even though um, the English people use the metric system as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah, so it's <laughs> – pretty funny and hard to follow but 100 feet elevation gain but yeah there's there's the numbers there um yeah okay <laughs> sorry I, I i won't do the the maths uh in my head or on the run because then you'll learn how bad my arithmetic is and i don't want to embarrass myself um okay another question from British Biker 97 again, um, do you know how these compare to flywheel systems, both use motors and generators with a mass? I can think of some obvious trade-offs from both, but these seem to be getting more attention recently. Yeah, so I did have, um, I, I don't have all, all of the information here that I was looking at, but flywheels are on here as well. And I don't know a lot about flywheels. It is um, on my kind of mental long list of topics to do, especially because I, I know that there's an Australian company doing doing something in that space at least. So I was kind of hoping to get a tour at some point when I'm um, when travel opens up again. But yeah, basically flywheels seem to be shorter duration um, and I'm basing that purely off this graph here. So now you guys know as much as I do about flywheels. So, um, yeah, and it is interesting that they're getting more attention recently. Uh, I think on the one hand, I, and I had assumed that it was much longer um, duration and because that's the really hard thing. I think we have got quite a lot of solutions for the, the fast um, response, short duration stuff, um, but less so for the, the longer um, but and I, I mean, you can make a gravity energy storage system last as long as you you want. If you just are prepared to buy a lot of blocks and you have somewhere to put them, then you could you know um, sky's your limit <laughs> in terms of how long you could go. But um, yeah, I I am actually surprised why they're getting so much more attention. Then again, I mean, I do hear a lot about compressed air and, I mean, obviously we're all hearing a lot about hydrogen as well. So I think it's probably just energy storage in general and the longer the um, storage potential, then the more exciting the technology is because at the moment all we've got is pumped hydro and it's just so hard to, to make a lot more of it. Okay, another question from Hanselberry. What about putting our buildings on stilts and going up and down to store and release power? <laughs> no, I wouldn't like that. I get seasick, uh, really badly seasick. So I would not volunteer to live in a building like that. But I, like, I, I really like ideas like that. I think last time um, or recently somebody suggested to me that we could use elevators, um, lifts, as we call them here, as a energy storage um, and yeah i think that's a yeah that's that's a fun fun idea but i yeah i don't want to live in a house that moves up and down <laughs> uh any more questions no okay so um i just wanted to give some like general conclusions because i think I think it's interesting and I actually, um, the more that I looked into it, the more I can see a place for these technologies. I kind of, I often have this like instinctive kind of cynical response where I, um, you know, all the things that you you know already, you're like, these are the only things that are ever going to work and everything else is kind of like frivolous and, and silly. And I, I've, I've probably had that instinctive response. I don't like that I have that um instinct because you know you miss all of the real cool innovations if you just write off everything new as being um silly but i think um 
I, th I think something interesting about this technology is that they are all using mature components um, and have been promising for, you know, some of them for 10 years now that they're using mature components so there won't be um, much technology risk. They'll be develop really fast, they'll be cheap. And we haven't seen that yet. And I think, I mean, I know from my own career experience that um, it is just so easy to, to say you're going to use mature components and um, it's never nearly as easy as it sounds and um, it it can feel hard to to understand why things aren't progressing fast when you know like you take energy vault it's like it's a tower it's a crane it's a concrete block I mean what's so hard like there's nothing nothing new there just why do you even need to test this just go out and build it and it's done um, and I think that all of these companies, they have a really simple idea and certainly they're developing faster than they would if they had to, you know, in, invent a, a crane or a winch for themselves. But I think everybody here is learning that um, technologies that are mature in one industry, they can't just be applied to a totally different operating environment and everything will be okay. So my prediction is that at least one or two of these companies, or maybe maybe all of them, maybe more, will get this working in the next couple of years. Because I mean, I don't see any major technological leaps that have to occur. It's, it it is relatively mundane obstacles that they have to overcome. Um, I think probably their costs are going to rise first for the first couple of projects because. Um, they're going to need to make some modifications to these existing mature technologies that they weren't expecting. There'll probably be more maintenance than they're expecting. I think some of the companies seem likely to have a large shock in terms of maintenance, the ones that are promising to be maintenance free anyway. Um, and then I think the prices will probably drop to what they're currently projecting um, and what the analysts are projecting. But there's also not like a lot of cost potential below that. And they call that the, the learning rate. So, you know, something really high tech, like a new battery chemistry that has a high learning rate because there's, um, you know, new technologies to be discovered and um, things are moving fast. But using these mature technologies, you, you're never going to have that. So, I mean, there's not going to be a 75% reduction in the cost of a crane or a heavy block that you've made using concrete or dirt or whatever that, you know, it's just not that massive cost reduction potential there. Um, I would expect that the winning technologies or the ones that survive to, you know, participate in the storage ecosystem along with um, all the other storage techs that are going to come, I think that they will be the ones that are able to reduce their maintenance to a really low level and get their lifetimes long, which, I mean, they, they all talk about that, so I'm sure they're well aware. Um, and also those that will have the flexibility of where they can be located. Um, so. Yeah, I think to the extent that, you know, oh, if you must have a disused mine shaft that's been recently decommissioned, I think that that's a lot less likely to make like a long term viable um, company that can benefit from uh, scale than one that you can put anywhere. So I guess that that's why Gravitricity are, are looking into, um, you know, sinking their own shafts. Um, and then I think that I suspect <laughs> that with all these energy storage companies, one of the biggest problems that they face is probably more so than the technology is the financing um, because it's in this weird kind of space. Um, you know, everyone wants a really exciting new technology idea to invest in because that's where the, you know, there's a big upside for investors, right? You know, it could be worth thousands of times what it is now in the future um, if it's a brand new technology that can break through and really shake things up. But on the other hand, uh, if you want uh, energy technology soon and large, then you need to use this mature technology. So uh, I think that it's challenging investment environment and I won't be surprised if we see a lot of good technologies go bankrupt um, before they reach their potential. Um, so I actually, I think that's a really interesting aspect. I'm thinking about getting some uh, clean tech finance uh, experts uh, on the channel. So let me know if you think that would be interesting. But yeah, that's, uh, that's the end of my technical analysis or opinion. Um, is there any more questions? Um, 
I see that there's lots here. So that's cool. All right, I'll put one up from British Biker again. <laughs> Very insightful. It's all good to come down to the money. It always does. That is so true. It's like uh, <laughs> nearly any question that I answer um, or that I ask on my channel, like why, you know, whatever, the answer is always money. It's just always, <laughs> always money. Um, okay. Oh, oops, sorry, I just, uh, I'll go back to that one. This one, um, hashtag airships. This one was funny because I actually was looking at um, an airship technology for a video that I'm making coming up on um, like really uh, out there, next big thing type wind energy. And one of the ones that I was looking at was literally a, a blimp with a turbine in it. And it's like a kite energy, but also a, a blimp. So that caught my eye. Um, yeah, so sorry, go back to this one that I just hid. Um, yeah, challenging to use gravity to store energy economically from conservator. And yeah, I think I think that that is, um, that's true, but it's a new problem that we have to solve. So I think that people are going to keep on trying until it gets there. And like I said, I actually do think that we'll have some gravity stuff. I don't, I don't know to what extent it's going to penetrate at the moment more than 90% of our energy storage is from um, pumped hydro. So I don't know, we'll, I'm not saying we're going to get 50-50 with gravity and um, hydro, but I think it'll, it'll do something. Um, okay, so I just want to thank um, my Patreon, um, the Patreon community. They helped me with questions before I, um, I got in touch with the companies. So uh, yeah, I need to thank them a lot. And also mention that if you, um, yeah, if you want to join us, then you can do that um, at that link there that I just put up on the screen. And then also a huge thanks to the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. Um, they sponsor these live streams, um, make it possible. So thanks to that. Sorry, <laughs> thanks to them for that. And um, you can check out the podcast, the Uptime podcast that I co-host with Alan and Dan from WeatherTech. The link is in the description. And also sign up for the weekly WeatherGuard Tech News email there as well. Um, and then I also just wanted to give the update that I um, got from the Vortex Bladeless team. Um, so they, they gave me a really long response. Um, not there, there wasn't anything, any mistakes made, but they wanted to add some more information. Um, I'll maybe I'll copy and paste the um, text in the description later. But they did want to cover. I did want to cover a few points that they raised first. Wake loss. Um, so they said, although they have a wake, the downstream devices are not badly affected by it. And um, there is some sort of possibility for the devices to interact in a positive way, synchronizing um, and maybe improve energy. So I'll, yeah, let's wait and see what happens there. Um, the uh, power coefficient, the CP, um, they say, as you know, CPs of small wind turbines are far from the ones achieved in big models um, and their current CP is similar to small wind turbines between 0.2 and 0.3 and they're working on optimizing that they expect it to grow as devices are scaled up. Then they say why low wind speeds, the most common average wind speed around the world is four meters per second. There's not much energy there. It's preferable to have a device that can be working as many hours per year as possible. Um, better to be generating a few watts all day long versus generating lots of watts only a few times a month. And this is a point that I strongly disagree with. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, I really think that three three watts that they get at their um, cut in wind speed is not not worth generating so that that's just something we have to agree to disagree on um okay and then uh then they also mentioned that um for domestic generation yes you'd need a lot of vortex models to match the power generated by a roof covered in solar panels if there is enough sun then they cannot compete with PV solar, it's just too good. But on the other hand, if you were um, looking at small wind um, or if you don't have a lot of sun, then you might find that the, or they say that you will find that the Vortex Bladeless model is going to outperform because it doesn't need the maintenance and a lot of small wind turbines are very disappointing in um, the actual production versus their 
um, specs that they say the ma theoretical maximum power production. And I will agree with that, that small wind turbines are very commonly um, misrepresented. So um, yeah, I actually do have a video coming up soon, hopefully in um, within a week about small wind and um, yeah, and how you can kind of pick your way through the over hype um, and you know, ones that actually do what they say. So you can keep an eye out for more on small wind coming up. Next topic for live stream will be in a couple of weeks and it's going to be artificial intelligence slash machine learning in um, clean energy transition. And I'm going to have a special guest expert for that. We're going to be talking about what AI is, or actually my expert will be because I, I'm not one. Uh, he's going to talk about what artificial intelligence is, what it's good at, what it's not so good at, and where we think there's good potential for its use in the clean energy transition. So I will be putting up a community post next week asking for links to articles about clean energy applications for AI. So if you've seen any clean energy texts where you wondered whether there was actually good potential for AI to do something or suspected maybe it was just a buzzword designed to attract attention, then um, please share those with me. And like I said, I'll put up a community post. Um, yeah, and so that's uh, that's it for today's live stream. And thanks, thanks for tuning in and for all the amazing comments. I'll have a look through all the ones that I, I missed later. But yeah, thank you very much. Oh, this is a, a comment that I like. Yeah, new new page. <laughs> thank you, conservator. That's really nice. Cool. Oh, and. Uh, British black a small spot for a soft spot for small winds. So very excited. Yeah, uh, I hope that I. <laughs> it's a bit. It's a bit of a um, maybe I'm a bit of a party pooper because I mean I love small wind. It's cool, but um, yeah, I, it gets so hyped and it frustrates me that people think it's the answer to everything. Okay, so I'm gonna end it there. Um, thanks everyone, and I'll see you in uh, a couple of weeks. Bye.